Friends and colleagues, permit me to begin our formal business meeting with my report as president. Perhaps this year, more of a reflection on my time leading BSA. But first, as a reminder, following my remarks, Erin will give hers as executive director, and then Heather Wolf, chair of the nominating committee, will present the slate of nominees for officers and the council class of 2025, and we will hold our election. We must have a quorum of 100 members voting for our election to be binding. I ask that all members in good standing to please remain with us and participate in this critical part of today's meeting. Throughout my term as president, volunteers have come forward to work hard on our various committees and working groups, especially for the coming year. Members have offered to serve and are doing so with dedicated enthusiasm. Erin will speak to these activities in her report. My time as president has been one of drawing upon the wisdom of colleagues and friends. The establishment of an executive committee allowed Erin and me to think creatively and at length about the future. How BSA can sustain our brilliant bibliographical heritage and then move us into the rapidly changing shape of the digital age and a schedule of regular executive committee meetings throughout each year ensure that the business of BSA flew so smoothly between council meetings. On the executive committee, permit me to thank those who shared their professional advice. Michael Ryan and Ken Soner served two years each as vice presidents. They were always there to offer seasoned and sound thinking on key issues. Joan Friedman, as head of the audit committee and tireless chair of the policy and procedures manual working group, spent hours every week to document how BSA currently functions. The work of this group, which includes Irene Tishner, David Vandermeulen, Alice Schreier, and John Bidwell, will lead next to a somewhat overdue reassessment of our bylaws. Jenny Lowe and then John McQuillan mastered the role of secretary, how to keep both the council and the executive committee meetings functioning from one session to the next. And Scott Clemens as treasurer determined how BSA could remain solvent in a pandemic through a very successful challenge grant. To all of these people, I am profoundly grateful. One special thanks to Nick Wilding, who headed the search committee for the new co-editors of PBSA. Nick led the process seamlessly from the beginning, right to the successful hiring of Sarah Warner and Jesse Erickson, our new co-editors. And this leads me to the establishment of a development committee that allowed BSA to begin to create a culture of philanthropy as BSA sustains and constantly revitalizes itself to meet all challenges, whether expected or unexpected. I'm thinking here of the pandemic. I thank especially Megan Constantinou, vice chair, for keeping us focused and her elegant editing of grant proposals. Mary Crawford for her expertise in planned giving. Patrick Olson for promoting sponsorship opportunities for this week's annual meeting. And to Michael Ryan, Ken Soner, and Michael Suarez for their overall understanding of philanthropy and furthering the long-term goals of BSA. A few words about the specifics of our development activities over the past four years. With the founding of the Stillwell Legacy Society, we now have 28 individuals who have placed BSA into their estate plans. I thank each of them sincerely for their belief in the future of bibliographical excellence. And my hope is that more members will be inspired to join the Legacy Society in the years ahead. The challenge grant initiated by members of the council and officers was twice over successful. The alacrity of the membership to contribute to the one-to-one -one matching program was astounding and reflects the generosity of spirit of so many of you with us today. Consider as well the long list of 
headquarters of this very meeting and Bib Week events. Booksellers, professional associations, publishers, and educational organizations are all working together with BSA to promote the study and teaching of Bibliography Week. And I would be remiss not to include the ongoing support of foundations, the Pine Tree and Peck Stackpool Foundations for fellowships, the Delmas Foundation for the reconceptualization and reactivation of BibSite. And to those individuals who have supported the Reese Fellowship, additional funding for the New Scholars Awards, the Dorothy Porter Wesley Fellowship, the Mercantile Fellowship, and the new fully funded endowment for the Mercantile Prize. Thank you to Dorothy Hurt, George Ong, Bruce and Mary Crawford, John Neal Hoover, and one anonymous donor. Thank you all. And finally, my appreciation to the numerous BSA members, both members now and those who have gone before us, who consciously determined to help position the Bibliographical Society for the 21st century. This is now the time to recognize those whose term as leaders of BSA has ended. David Gantz, we thank you for your extensive role as editor of PBSA, and to mark your accomplishment, we shall be sending you a calligraphic certificate. You arrived as editor of PBSA in a time of distress and led us forward with intelligence and a strong sense of duty. Our sincere thanks. Jackie Vossler, as she leaves the council, will also be leaving as chair of investments. Our endowment is thriving in great part because of her leadership of strategic decisions. Moving forward, Mary Crawford will be assuming this role. Mark Samuels Lasner, although leaving the council and having served in the nominating committee this year, is joining the audit committee. And Sonia Drummer, who valiantly chaired the events committee during COVID lockdown, will be handing over the committee to Ashley Cataldo. In conclusion, my thanks to many supporters of BSA. It has been for me personally and professionally an exciting four years as president, and I thank all of you. <laughs> Good afternoon, BSA members and friends. Please allow me to echo Barbara's remarks. Our society has a great deal to be proud of, and we simply could not achieve so much without the generous support of individual donors, foundations, and businesses who make our programs possible with their financial support. Thank you for helping to foster bibliographical study and scholarship broaden our reach by offering accessible and equitable programs and build a bigger and more vibrant organization. Many of you here today, um, I'm, I'm here with some of our volunteers, you will see them um, soon on your screen, but also in our virtual audience, so many of you give your time to BSA. The volunteers who serve on committees, working groups, and on the council, and as officers of the society, are BSA's greatest source of energy and inspiration. I am incredibly lucky to work with all of you, and thank you really doesn't begin to express my gratitude for the contributions you make to our programs, governance, fiduciary management, and fundraising. I am not exaggerating when I say that we cannot do it without you. I want to join Barbara in honoring David Gantz's years of service as editor of PBSA and also recognize the contributions of managing editor Megan J. Brown. They have worked diligently to facilitate a smooth transition to our new team of editors, Sarah Werner and Jesse Erickson. Those of you who attended Wednesday's information session with them are surely as excited as I am about the future direction of the journal. This year, Drs. Werner and Erickson will be working with the Publications Committee to fulfill the Society's Equity Action Plan commitments to the journal by bringing new members onto the journal's advisory board. 
I'm also delighted to say that the council has invested in a project to update the look of the journal. The new design will incorporate the society's new graphic identity while maintaining its legible scholarly look. The redesigned journal will start appearing in your inboxes in May 2024. Earlier on the horizon, look for Derek Spire's keynote lecture from the 2021 annual meeting, Liberation Bibliography, in your mailboxes this March. And in June, PBSA and the Mellon Foundation funded Black Bibliography Project will celebrate Juneteenth with a special issue of the journal. Guest edited by the co-directors of the Black Bibliography Project, Meredith McGill and Jackie Goldsby, the issue will feature articles, a bibliographical note, and book reviews on the topic of Black bibliography by the best scholars in the field. We are honored and excited to collaborate with the Black Bibliography Project to publish the scholarship evolving from their bibliographically rich work. Our fellowship and new scholars programs remain as competitive and vibrant as ever. We receive far more worthy applications each year than we can possibly fund. During Barbara Shaler's tenure as president, we have expanded these keystone programs through fundraising and building new opportunities for scholars in bibliography. Barbara has mentioned the new fellowships that we are proud to offer. The new scholars program has also seen an important expansion. In addition to speaking today and receiving funding to travel to present in New York, new scholars also benefit from a cash prize and funding to travel to upcoming Bibliography Week programs. These are investments in these scholars as well as in the society's future. We are striving to bring the next generation of bibliographers together with our established community to form the networks that will sustain BSA into the future. I want to also highlight the work of our events committee and the new liaison subcommittee. In the past, members of the events committee and li liaisons to other learned societies and allied organizations met together to plan programs. Under Sonia Drimmer's leadership, the events committee reorganized to foster more mission-driven events. Members of the liaison subcommittee, chaired by Catherine Parisian, focus on route outreach to specific organizations the Renaissance Society of America, the College Art Association, and the Center for Book Arts, just to name a few example, examples. They organize bibliographical panels at their conferences and or create co-sponsored events for the general public. The Events Committee has developed an innovative model for BSA's events programming. Under the distributed conference model, BSA welcomes and reviews proposals from our community three times each year. While we have held conferences in the past and hope to do so again in the future, BSA does not hold an annual conference like so many of our peer learned societies. Through the distributed conference model, BSA invites bibliographers to plan the panels, workshops, and other events locally or online that drive conversations about what is happening in the field right now. This model reduces our carbon footprint. BSA events meet you where you are and lowers barriers to participation by making events free and open to the largest audience possible. Much like other scholarly conferences, events proposals are carefully reviewed by our committee to ensure their scholarly integrity and relevance to BSA's mission. Unlike other scholarly conferences, BSA allows event organizers to propose a budget for the events, incorporating honoraria for speakers and accessibility features like captioning and live simultaneous audio interpretation for the audience. In the spirit of our equity action plan and in recognition of the financial challenges faced by so many of our members, we do not charge registration fees and we do compensate presenters for their labor. Rising inflation and shrinking professional development budget and travel funds should not our, impede our ability to contribute to the field. This year, Ashley Cataldo and I will be participating in an Ithaca SNR project funded by the Alfred P, P. Sloan Foundation and JSTOR Labs to explore the future of scholarly meetings. The society was invited to participate because of the innovative approaches that BSA has been taking. While there is certainly room to improve and evolve, I'm proud to say that BSA is already leading the field in this area by thinking creatively, even with our limited resources. If you are interested in submitting a proposal to the Events Committee, please take a look at our website because the spring, spring call will soon be open and posted there. Virtual events like this one have continued to sustain the society during challenging times. 
Video recordings on our YouTube channel are bringing bibliography to an audience of over 900 subscribers. I think it's actually closer to 1,000 today. Faculty are assigning our recorded programs in their syllabi. Every day, around 75 people watch a video on a bibliographical topic on our channel. You're laughing, but it's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> and last year, they watched over 3,000 hours of bibliographical conversations thanks to the events that we recorded and posted online. We are expanding our reach by leaps and bounds there. With the help of the Delmas Foundation, we inv have invested in BibSite to continue developing accessible resources for our community of collectors, librarians, conservators, and curators, faculty and students, and independent scholars. Eric Ensley, Emma Sarconi, and Adriana Cesares are working with me to and will we'll look forward to a beta launch of the new website in April. The new site will aggregate resources for teaching, learning, and studying bibliography, not just resources that BibSite will host under Creative Commons licenses, such as introductory syllabi developed in a summer program and other materials contributed by our community, also the kinds of resources that are already and have been on BibSite for years now, but also linking out to resources created by individuals and institutions. All of these will have bibliographical relevant descriptive metadata that will make them more discoverable to experts and newcomers to the field alike and help people connect to the intellectual tradition of bibliography through the many resources that are already available online. Please stay tuned for an announcement about the launch this spring and consider, consider contributing material that you might like to see hosted somewhere. There is a great deal more I could say about our programs, but I want to conclude with our sal a salute to our outgoing president, Barbara Shaler. We have accomplished all of this and more thanks to her ambitious vision, her commitments to philanthropy and to our mission, and a leadership style that prioritizes consensus building and inclusion. I'm lucky to have started this position in the, as the society's first full-time executive director with Barbara as my closest collaborator and ally. Thank you for being a model leader, a mentor, <laughs> and for having me as your co-pilot. I am not alone in recognizing Barbara's outstanding service and would also like to thank, take this opportunity to thank the anonymous donor who made a contribution to today's reception. This tribute is, this gift is a tribute to you, Barbara, in appreciation of your outstanding service to BSA as president. Wow. So it is a pleasure to end my remarks on that note today. Please stay with us now for the report of Heather Wolf, chair of the nominating committee and the election of officer, the officers and the council class of 2025. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Heather Wolf, chair of this year's nominating committee. Joining me on the committee this year were Devin Fitzgerald, Mark Samuels Lasner, Naomi Nelson, and Curtis Small, with Erin McGurl and Barbara Shaler serving in an advisory capacity. This year, Barbara Shaler is stepping down as president after serving two terms, and Mark Samuels Lasner and Jackie Vossler are completing second terms as members of the class of 2022. We circulated a call for nominations for the positions of president and two council members in June 2021 and received a great response. So thank you to each and every one of you who took the time to nominate one of your colleagues. After careful consideration and thoughtful and lively conversation among the committee and with the individual nominees, we are happy to present the slate of officers and council members for the membership to vote on at today's meeting. This slate and the biographies of each candidate were posted to the BSA website on December 14th. The nominating committee is incredibly grateful to the nominees for their willingness to take on these new and or continuing responsibilities over the next few years. For the position of officers who serve two-year terms, for president, we have Caroline Duracell Mellish. For vice president, we have Megan Pizer. For secretary, John McQuillan, 
and for treasurer, Scott Clemens. For the council class of 2025, the two new members are Rebecca Romney and Derek Spires. Alice Schreier will be serving a second term in this council class of 2025, and Ken Soner is moving from the vice president position back to the council to fill the vacancy left by Caroline Duracell Mellish, who was going to serve a second term and is now going to be president. Thank you so much, respectfully submitted. Thank you, Heather, for the report. And as president, can I now have a motion for the election to proceed? Motion to approve this week. Thank you, Megan. Second. Thank you, John. So we are now open yes. for people to vote. If you are an active member of the society and you have not submitted a proxy vote yet, please fill the um, poll on your screen. We have to date received 108 votes in favor of the slate, no votes in opposition, and two abstentions for the record. And so we will wait another moment for those of you who have not cast your vote by proxy online already to please cast your votes online. Thanks to everyone who's doing that. The numbers keep ticking up as to number of votes. So keep on, <laughs> keep on going. And I will say slate has passed. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone for voting. This does just take a moment to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to make their voice heard or their, their mouse heard, I guess. <laughs> their finger <laughs> click. <Their> clicks <laughs> registered. Okay, so we have a total, total of 42 total. That's right. It's still going. It's still going. We're over quorum though, right? We are over quorum, yes. But I think we should just wait to yeah. see. Mm -hmm. Yeah so that we have an official record yes thank you everyone for bearing with us um, our friends at the grolier club um there are five more in favor so <laughs> now we are up to 49 and no nays and abstentions. so i think that we can I think we can proceed and we will have a record of all of this delivered to us from convene plus. Okay, so as president, I can say now that the slate has passed and I thank you all for participating today. Okay, so is Caroline supposed to come? There you go. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Caroline Duracell Millich, and I am delighted to be the next president of the Bibliographic Hall Society of America. It is an exciting time to become president of the BSA. Thanks to the work of current BSA president, Barbara Scheller, Vice President Kenneth Sonner, Executive Director Erin McGurl, Council and committee members, the BSA is a healthy and active organization, and it is on the move. The Society's membership is growing and is increasingly diverse. Thanks to successful fundraising campaigns, the Society's financial resources are stronger. Through its website, virtual events, and social media presence, the Society's online activities are, have increased exponentially and are reaching out to a wider audience. The Society is committed to fostering a wide range of bibliographical practices and studies of textual artifacts produced by diverse communities of practitioners in different societies and time periods. During my tenure as president, I will seek to support such dynamism, to expand interest in bibliographical studies, and to make the society more diverse and inclusive in all areas of its activity. 
I intend to carry this out by working closely with Vice President Megan Pizer, Executive Director Erin McGurl, Council and committee members, and with all of you, for it is only thanks to your work and your support that BSA will keep moving forward and remain a flourishing society. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Halito, Soho Chifo Yet Megan Paiser A Chata Thia. Oklahoma Amiti Chata Wawiantnag Atali. Hello, my name is Megan Paiser. I am Choctaw, and the Choctaw Removal Land is in Oklahoma, but I come to you today from Wawiantnag, which is Anishinaabek for where the curved shores meet sometimes called Detroit, Michigan, the homelands of the Anishinaabe people. I am honored to be a guest on their traditional and ancestral lands. I'm excited to be welcomed to serve alongside our new president, Caroline, as your Bibliographical Society of America Vice President for the coming term. As Caroline has so aptly noted, our society is robust and thriving, due to the dedicated labors of our past leaders and their willingness to make essential contributions towards change in a time of strife. We are welcoming new members from more broad backgrounds, educations, knowledge systems, fields of work and interests, languages, nationalities, identities, abilities, and gifts than ever before. I look forward to learning about you all and learning how to sustainably nourish our society for what lies ahead. Yakoke, thank you for entrusting me with this work. Good afternoon. Membership in the society increased during 2021 to 757 individual members, including 156 emerging, 419 partner, 82 sustaining, 22 leadership, three advancing, 67 lifetime or honorary members, and five in our new membership category for Latin American residents. Excellent news for the society is that over the past four years, our membership has increased by about 100 new members per year from 451 members in 2018 to 554 in 2019, 680 in 2020, and now up to 757 members for 2021. We wish to congratulate the membership, fellowships, new scholars, and events committees, not to mention Aaron McGurl and all of those who have worked to produce and ensure the success of the Society's expanded programming and outreach to our growing membership especially during the pandemic. In 2021, four members of the society passed away. Giovanni Favretti, Dorothy Sloan, Anna Lou Ashby, and William P. Barlow. Only recently did we learn of the deaths in 2020 of two members, Madeline Kripke and Catherine Lee. We offer a moment of silence in their memory. Hi there, my name is Scott Clemens, and now for the moment you have all been waiting for, the report of the Finance Committee and the Treasurer. I shall be mercifully brief. 
The framework that I want to use to talk about our finances for last year is rather simple. We'll look at the sources of income, and then we'll look at where the money goes. And finance and budgeting really isn't any more complicated than that. Our largest source of income is our endowment. We draw a little over $160,000 from our endowment in 2021. And as you see, that accounts for 47% of our total spending. Importantly and prudently, that spending rate equates to only about 4% of the average value of our endowment over the past three years. And as a reminder, we endeavor to keep that spending rate at a no greater than 5% so that the endowment continues to grow and so that it can continue to support the society in the future. Clearly, this is an important driver of our financial stability, hence the focus on the Stillwell Society to honor those individuals who have remembered the society and their estate plans at any level, by the way. Contributions, both individual and institutional, accounted for another 23% of our income last year. Unlike the endowment, this represents donations used in the current fiscal year to support operations and programming. Membership accounted to almost $42,000 of income or 12% of our total revenues during the year. And as I stop here with a pie chart that looks suspiciously like Pac-Man, and I date myself in making that reference, you can see that 82%, the sum of these three pieces, 82% of our revenues are due to the support of members and friends uh, like you. Thank you for that generosity, both now and into the future. Award underwriting is 7% of our revenues. These are third-party supporters of named gifts. Uh, and, and although these are funds that come into the society and then go right back out of the society in the form of prizes and fellowships, uh, nonetheless, it is an important demonstration of how the society serves as a conduit for philanthropic support in the bibliographic community. Publications amount for about 5% of our total revenues last year. A specific draw from the endowment for BSA-sponsored fellowships, prizes, and awards amounts to 3%. And then finally, rounding out the picture, grants $9,000 last year, roughly 3% of our total income. So where does it go? Three broad areas, programs, overhead, and fundraising. And that's a familiar breakdown if you're used to reading not-for-profit accounting. That's a rather common way to divide the uses of funds. Programming for us, the green-ish colored slices here, add up to 58% of our spending. The general programs category here at 22% represents the broad work of the society across all of our programmatic areas. It includes a certain portion of overhead and a direct allocation of our executive director's time. Prizes and fellowships, awards account for $60,000 or 18% of spending. New scholars programs and publications, 40,000 or about 12% of spending. And then events, all of which were virtual in 2021, about 6% of spending. And that's probably a low number for events simply because we didn't have any, at least in person. There's certainly a cost attached to what we're doing now via Convene, but that's a number that's artificially depressed last year uh, for obvious reasons. The bluish colored uh, pie charts here are more general overhead expenses. We are an operating foundation, so there is work that takes place to make the foundation run. 20% of our spending is on professional services, think accounting, legal work, investment management. 11% of our spending, or 36,000 on personnel, there are some personnel costs allocated directly to programs, and then direct cost of our office, about 6% of spending. Final piece of the pie is fundraising. Here too, there wasn't a whole lot of that in 2021 because of the constraint on events. So that number you see there is largely postage and mailing. This is an environment where personal fundraising, in-person fundraising is inadvisable to say the least, and here's to that changing relatively soon. I'm recording this report uh, a day before the council meets to consider the budget for 2022. So what I show you here on this final slide is more of a working budget. I anticipate that the final budget will look very, very similar to this. I will not go through this line by line, but perhaps make a few observations. The rise in planned endowment spend reflects two things, not only an increase in the value of our endowment, 
but also an actual underspend during the 2021 year. In 2022, we expect that to return back to a more normal level. The expense categories also assume a return to a more normal level of activity and more in-person activities, hence the rise that you see in events and fundraising. Here, too, what this represents is really more of a return to normal than a genuine expansion of those aspects of our spending. Let me close on a note of gratitude for the financial support, the psychological support, even the spiritual support that all of you have provided to our society. I am proud of the work we do. I am excited for what lies ahead, and I am confident that from a financial perspective, we are in good shape. The Audit Committee, for reasons I will explain shortly, has had a busier year than normal, but has nothing unusual or adverse to report. The committee met via Zoom with our then current auditors, Condon O'Meara, on Tuesday, April 6th. At that date, we received the report of their review of the Society's 2020 financial statements. A review involves less investigation than an audit, and no assurances are provided, but we were informed that no material misstatements were found and our financials are believed to be in good order. You may recall that some years ago, we opted for a schedule of one audit every three years with reviews done in intervening years as a cost-saving option. In separate business, the committee met on several occasions to consider hiring a new auditing firm for upcoming reviews and audits. We have been with Condon O'Meara for well over a decade and good auditing practice dictates periodic changes in auditing firms in order to keep fresh eyes on our accounting practices. We also believed that it might be possible to save some money on the cost of our annual reviews and audits and this has proved to be the case. In February, we submitted requests for proposals to six firms recommended to us by other organizations of our type and received lengthy responses from five of those firms. After a consideration of multiple factors, on April 8th, we selected the firm of Hansman Weibel of Charlottesville, Virginia to be our new audit firm. Council confirmed this choice on April 24th. We look forward to a good relationship with Hansman Weibel over at least the next three years. For our 2021 financial statements, we are again due only for a review with our next audit to come after this year's financial results are in. The partner in charge of our account, Ed Schmidt, has already begun working with the society office and our contracted outside accountants, the firm Donasco, Sena and Jahelka. We expect their report by the end of March and I will be reporting to council in April on the outcome of this year's engagement. I am especially grateful to committee members, Tad Bomer, Scott Clemens, Mary Crawford, Tom Goldwasser, and Jackie Vossler for the thoughtful time they devoted to our work this year. We say farewell to Jackie at this time and welcome Mark Samuels Lassner as a new member. Respectfully submitted, Joan Friedman, Chair, Audit Committee. Hi, I'm honored today to present the report of the Fellowship Committee on behalf of our distinguished chair, Hope Mayo. This year, the committee received nearly 40 applications and made 15 awards. Our program always has been and remains competitive, even during the global pandemic when fewer people are able to travel for their research. By comparison, in a non-pandemic year, we receive upwards of 60 applications. Congratulations to all of those whose now, names are now appearing on your screen. I will highlight just a few. Sarah Johnson is our second Dorothy Porter Wesley Fellow. Her project, Moreau Saint-de-Marie, 
a slaveholding bibliophile, supports an ongoing book project that combines traditional academic chapters and experimental work that plays with archival fragments and visual culture to tell the stories of free people of color and enslaved women and men who enabled Moreau as a collector. The Porter Fellowship is funded with gifts from Bruce and Mary Crawford and Barbara Shaler through 2023. And we are actively seeking funding to continue the work of Black, Black bibliographers through the Dorothy Porter Wesley Fellowship. Thanks to ASEX, William Reese Company, the St. Louis Mercantile Library, the Peck Stackpool Foundation, and the Pine Tree Foundation of New York for your ongoing support of our fellowship program. Your commitments foster bibliographical research that enriches our broad, the, our broad community with projects ranging from Lindsay Eckert's work on the history of bookbinding to Matilda Malaspina's studies of Hernando Colon's Libro, Libro de los Epitomes to Sarah Haining's work on the description of LGBTQ plus archival materials. Year after year, we see a return on that investment. At yesterday's Both and Bibliography panel on maps in books, the panelists Jordana Dim and Carla Loire are the 2020 recipients of the Tannenbaum Fellowship in Cartographical Bibliography. You can find their research um, publication on maps in books online now through Taylor and Francis. So thank you once again to those individuals, groups, organizations, and foundations whose generosity enables the Society's Fellowship Program. Also, congratulations once again to our 2022 Fellows. I'm so excited to see the work that you continue to produce and share with our community um, come to free, uh, fruition through your research fellowships. So now we go to yeah. Michelle and Brian. Yeah, good. Hello, I'm Laura Wozwitz, Curator of Children's Literature at the American Antiquarian Society and Chair of the Justin G. Schiller Prize Committee. The Schiller Prize is awarded every three years by the Bibliographical Society of America to honor a bibliographic study of pre-20th century children's literature. The prize is funded by longtime children's book dealer, Justin Schiller. This year, I am very pleased to announce that the prize committee is recognizing two path-breaking works in the field. This year's Schiller Prize honorable mention has been awarded to Shauna McDermott, a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh and now a visiting professor at the University of St. Andrews for her 2020 dissertation, Visualizing the Future, Childhood, Race, and Imperialism in Children's Magazines, 1873, to 1939. The committee made the following comments on Ms. McDermott's dissertation, which studied the portrayal of race in the periodicals, Our Young Folks, Wide Awake, Babyland, John Martin's book, and The Brownies book. A thought-provoking and creative study incorporating publishing history, phrenology, eugenics, and illustration technology to show how children of color faded from substandard persons in need of help from their white peers or objects of curiosity to being visually erased from the white mainstream magazines. She did wonderful work on unearthing the message and historical underpinnings of the Brownies book as the main source of countering messages to those of white supremacy made by the other titles. This is an ambitious dissertation that engages readers across the fields of children's literature, childhood studies, African-American studies, visual culture, and the history of science. This year's Justin G. Schiller Prize is awarded to Hannah Field, a professor at the University of Sussex for Playing with the Book, Victorian Movable Picture Books and the Child Reader, published by University of Minnesota Press in 2019. According to the committee, this is a sophisticated study playfully intersecting between the history of the book, 
visual culture, cultural history, literary history, and art history into one narrative, forcefully making the case for movable books as profound cultural artifacts, not just because of the way that they are put together, but how they interact with child readers. This was a truly engaging interdisciplinary project that will be useful to a variety of audiences and is sure to be much cited in the years to come. Hannah Field takes us on a richly rewarding journey into children's reading experience, an embodied sensory practice done with the hands as well as the eyes and the mind an exercise that stretches the history of the book and crosses the divide between books and ephemera, children's books and toys, the verbal, the visual, and the tactile. Please join me in congratulating Hannah Field and Shauna McDermott for their truly trailblazing work. Um, thank you so much for awarding my book, Playing With a Book. Victorian Movable Picture Books and the Child Reader, the Justin Schiller Prize for 2022. Um, my hunch when I started work on the book was that paying close attention to the forms of children's books, um, especially to sort of books that might be outliers to our definition of what a book is, like the movable and novelty picture books that I worked on here, that paying attention to these things could help us to understand better children's agency as readers. And so, of course, the place I needed to go to find techniques to do this was bibliography and book history. It also meant that the book really couldn't have been completed without the amazing um, access that I had to the collection I worked with, which was the OP collection of children's literature at the Bodleian Library. And I'd, I'd like to, to thank the OPs for their amazing scholarship and collecting an endowment of that collection. I also got to work with some wonderful uh, librarians who really shaped the project, including Clive Hurst, who um, had the amazing dedication to once bring me a flashlight in the reading room so that I could look at a, a shadow book um, in the way that it, something approaching the way that it had originally been intended. And true dedication. At Oxford, my thinking was also shaped by my supervisors, Diane Perkis and Stefano Evangelista, and by my thesis examiners. Claire Pettit at King's College London and Helen Small at Oxford. I developed the project later on. I'd like to thank the institutions that I worked at since my doctorate, University of Sussex and the University of Lincoln, and also the staff at the University of Minnesota Press, including Danny Kasprzak, who really helped me um, to work on the book and to bring it to you in the form that you see it today. On that note, it was really important to me because part of the book is about color printing. The Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art helped me to fund the colour plates in the book, so thank you so much to them. I'd also just really, of course, like to thank the Bibliographical Society of America, the Schiller Prize Committee, including the chair, Laura Vasovitz, and all of the other um, scholars who read my book so carefully and provided such great comments on it. I'm so grateful for this honour. And I'm also really grateful, of course, to Justin Schiller for endowing the prize and for all of the work that he has done to bring the scholarship of pre 20th century children's literature um, to the place that it is today, which is just amazing. So thank you so much for this honor. I, I hope that if you haven't read the book that you, that you will, and I'm just really, really thrilled. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure and pride and joy to inform you all of a very special action that the Council of the Bibliographical Society of America took at its meeting uh, last Saturday. Article 9, paragraph 3 of our bylaws allows the Council, by unanimous vote, to elect an honorary member of the Society, a step rarely taken by the Society, but taken this year to honor, to recognize, and to congratulate the outstanding contributions that Barbara Shaler has made to the life of the society over her tenure as president for the past four years. We celebrated and commemorated this with a commendation that reads as follows. The Bibliographical Society of America honors and salutes Barbara A. Shaler in recognition of her devoted service. The council officers and staff of the Bibliographical Society of America wish to express their sincere appreciation 
and gratitude to Barbara A. Shaler. Ms. Shaler served as president of the society from January 2018 to January 2022 and was elected an honorary member by the council on January 23rd, 2022. Under her leadership, the society has grown and thrived through major organizational changes and the challenges brought on by the global pandemic. Let it be known that the Bibliographical Society of America is and shall remain profoundly indebted to Barbara A. Shaler for her many contributions and extraordinary service. When you get the chance, let her know that uh, as well, uh, if you would, either virtually or in person. With this election, Barbara becomes the fifth living honorary member of the society and only the third woman to have been so honored in the history of the society. We have been lucky to have Barbara's leadership over the past four years, and I feel luckier still to count her as a friend. Thank you, Barbara, for everything. Okay. Motion to adjourn. I second. Oh, wait, no, Barbara has to. Oh. Yeah, I'm <laughs> hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm, hi, I'm asking for a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Please. Motion to adjourn. And second. <laughs> okay. The meeting is over. Thank you all for joining us. And as you can see, we have a small group here and we are so pleased. Barbara, thank you. Here's to you. Cheers. 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 And to the Bibliographical Society of America going forward. Mm -hmm. And our new president. <laughs> new president. Here, here. Thank you all for joining us today. Indeed. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you, those of you, those of you who will be joining us at five, um, right here at Convene, 535th Avenue between 44th and 45th Streets, uh, for some bibliographical camaraderie to close out this really lovely day. Um, so thank you again for joining us and we will see you all soon. Take good care. Be well. Thank you. Okay.